Okay, good evening, everyone. Can I get your attention, please? Um, first off, I'm Bill Conley, District 1 Supervisor, uh, and I'm here, you know, like everyone behind me for your behalf. First thing I'd like to do is ask everybody to rise and let's have a moment of silence for those that lost their lives. Please join me in a moment of silence. Pray if you will. Amen. Thank you very much. And to, to you that lost your homes, your businesses, there's no words that anyone could project that loss back to you other than to empathize with you and be here to try to help you. That's why we're here tonight. We're here not to be confrontational in any manner whatsoever, but to, to, to honor what has happened and try to help you. Um, you're going to have questions. You're, you're, you're upset. This, this is understandable. We'll, we'll answer as many of them as we can in the presentations, and then we will take questions, but please fill out a card so that we can sort through them and make sure they're not duplicating each other, and then we'll, we'll get, get you the answers to the best of our ability. We really don't want to get into a debate or um, I know you're frustrated, I know you're angry, I, I can feel, I, I, can't, I can't empathize anymore with you, but nobody up here is here to do anything but to try to help you. So please, let's keep it down on the down low and keep it straight for everybody. There's gonna be representatives here tonight from law enforcement, local, state, and federal agencies. They've been on the ground from the very beginning. Um, they've had to do what they had to do to keep us safe. Please be respectful to all the updates as they're given to you. Please cooperate. And again, fill out a card if you have a question. Or if you have a real burning question, stay after and ask it personally. I want to thank uh, Kevin Thompson. Is he here? He opened the Southside Community Center tonight. I don't see him, but thank you to him, Pastor Kevin Thompson. It's a great place to have this meeting. Okay, there's a lot of questions about insurance, which under the circumstances can be confusing. We have help for you here, right here tonight. Representatives from the United Policy Holders are standing by to take your questions at the end of the briefing. We also know this experience has been stressful. I can imagine very stressful. There's help. Butte County Mental Health Counselors are available to talk with you at the meeting's conclusion and take that offer up. You're not, you know, you're just, you're not a ship onto yourself here. Please, if you need help, ask for it. So let me leave you this one last thing again. There's nobody here that isn't here to try, but to help you. Please be as considerate to them as they're gonna to be to you. And we'll get through this together. I'm here for you. And Supervisor Teeter is going to come up and say a few words. He's here for you, too. Thank you. Thanks, Bill. So, uh, you know, thank you all for coming here. Uh, it's pretty trying times for all of us. It's going to be a long road, but we're here. And part of my challenges is some of my district has been repopulated. And I uh, actually went up there with Red Cross, the sheriff, uh, and um, National Guard to deliver supplies. And I think the, the thing I'd like to impress is what Bill touched on is the communication. A lot of people don't have access to the internet. A lot of people don't have access to social media. Um, what I think is gonna be best is, is word of mouth. So when you hear about meetings like this, tell all your friends because they might not know. And, and I was seeing on social media that people are like going, you knew about this meeting, but why didn't you tell me? So please pass it along. And that way, we can get everyone the information that we're going to provide you tonight. And uh, I'm so sorry for all your losses and the, the hardships that we've all had. Thanks. Hi, I'm Jody Jones. I'm the mayor of Paradise. Thank you all for coming. Um, 
Those of you that live in paradise, none of us have been allowed to go back home. And I know that there's a lot of frustration building because it's taking a lot longer than we were anticipating to even get in to look at our houses. And I want you to know that I share that frustration. Um, we lost our home. My sister lost her home. She hasn't been up there. My husband hasn't been up there. We're all waiting for the announcement of when we can come up. And I, I just ask that you have as much patience as possible. Um, there are a lot of people up there working, actually thousands of people up there working on our behalf, getting it to a point where it's safe for all of us to go back there. And as soon as it is, those announcements will be coming out. So I just ask for your patience and also um, that and your civility as um, the supervisors did. We have both the police chief and the town manager here, and they both have a lot more specifics to share with you than I do. Um, and we will be here afterwards to answer questions as well. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Eric Reinbold, the Paradise Police Chief. Thank you for being here tonight. Um, I have a few things that I want to highlight. They're very similar to the information I provided last night at the press conference. Um, again, I want to reiterate that um, I myself have been impacted by the fire. My family's displaced. We're experiencing everything that you are firsthand. So I do have my deepest sympathy for all of you feeling the hardships that we're going through. Uh, having said that, we do understand everybody wants to get back up there. Um, we just ask that you continue to be understanding that it is very complex. And all the efforts towards making that happen um, are in place. There are thousands of people up there working. It's difficult for our police officers to even drive around in the town. And I fully expect that that um, is going to continue even after we uh, make the zones safe enough for people to re-enter into their their properties. The storm last week did slow some things down with the process of getting the hazardous trees removed. Um, there's been significant progress made on that and we are um, working very closely with everybody to get the town um, open as soon as possible, um, as soon as it's determined to be safe by all of the people that have a, a stake in that. So a little bit about the repopulation and the re-entry when we start doing that. It is going to be a very orderly and controlled process and it's going to be open by each zone. And that's to assure the safety of the residents during the re-entry process. We are going to allow a 24-hour period for residents only to return to those zones when the evacuation orders are lifted. Uh, you will be required to have identification. Some examples of that would be a driver's license, state ID, passport, a utility bill, um, or some other form of a valid photo ID. Um, upon re-entry, there's going to be some resources there. You'll be handed a safety kit with personal protective equipment as you re-enter, and there's going to be information pamphlets in there, so take the time to read those. Um, there are potential hazards when you return to your properties and your homes. We are still working diligently to open the Pence Road corridor, which will be zones 3, 8, and 14. And we hope to be able to do that in the very near future. Now, having said that, um, I know that some folks are limited to social media, but we will make sure that we get that information put out, not only on social media, but all the local media. And so uh, please stay in tune with that because it'll be very detailed and specific. And you will have notice ahead of time of your zones opening. Um, I think we're going to give a three hour window so you'll have time to get back into the area if you're not staying here locally. And I just want to remind you the official information about the evacuation orders being lifted will come directly from the Town of Paradise Police Department and the Butte County Sheriff's Office. That is going to be the most accurate and up-to-date information. Um, if you haven't signed up, Code Red is a great resource to sign up on your mobile devices so that you have access because we push that information out on there. And just as a reminder, um, there are still going to be dangerous conditions when you re-enter into those areas around your homes and residences. While we're going up there and mitigating the immediate hazards, um, those are areas 
that directly impact the utility right-of-ways and the public right-of-ways. So we're not going on to everybody's property and clearing hazardous trees. So um, it is still going to be a potentially dangerous uh, situation when you return to your properties. Also want to remind you that the roads are damaged. There may be debris in the roadway and um, there's going to be a significant amount of crews working in the area. So we do ask that you drive slow and you're mindful of all the people that <clears throat> are up there working to help restore our town. Um, if your home is still standing and you return when your zone is open, be prepared to be without utilities to include power and water as well as natural gas and bring supplies like food and water um, if you do choose to stay in your home when you return. Um, like all of us, I'll be here afterwards for specific questions. And uh, again, I just thank all of you for your patience and understanding, and we are working as quickly as possible to get Paradise open back up. Thank you, my name is Lauren Gill. I'm the town manager for the town of Paradise. So I will be speaking about the one thing I know about, right, the town. Um, and so um, bear with me a moment. Um, okay, so the chief just talked about trees. Now we have done a lot of work on the public rights of way, but trees on private property, whether they're limbs hanging over or trees that are dangerous, we have not assessed those and they have not been uh, removed. So when you're looking at your property and you're viewing and you're looking at the ashes and you're looking down and you're experiencing you know, your, your grief, remember to look up, to look around and be aware of your surroundings because those um, trees on private properties can be dangerous and limbs coming down. So there's been a group of people, um, armies of people up there actually working every day to get the utilities up and running. So when people go up there and see Paradise, some people just see right the ash or they experience their own loss and their own devastation. What I see is the town coming back up and I'm so excited to see um, our clinic is going to be open for us. There's gonna be a grocery store to open, coffee places, a couple of them. I'm not gonna name names, but I'm very excited about that. Um, we'll have some restaurants that are excited to open. Um, obviously, we want to get our water up and running, and, and you'll hear about that in a moment. But we will have some core services, and the um, actual town hall will be open to residents by the first of the year. Actually, probably January 2nd is our goal to be up serving our residents in the town of Paradise for the town of Paradise. So we'll have our property records and, and things that you can get um, there, and we will be able to serve you. But um, other than that, please, um, as you experience your personal uh, tragedies, know that we're all in this together, and um, we are also going to rebuild together, and there is a lot of hope. So remember that as we go forward. Thank you. Good evening, um, I'm Andy Miller. I'm the public health officer for the County of Butte. Uh, I'm here primarily to reinforce a hazard advisory that we put out on November 21st. And the purpose of that advisory was to urge people against living on completely destroyed properties. Uh, we realize that everybody wants to get back to their property and see it, we support that. Um, the health department, the environmental health department, many of the, the partners on the stage with me are, are here to help you uh, recover, but we want you to do it safely. Um, we're all working uh, to make sure that you have access to the services that will make your property safe and certified for rebuilding. Uh, we really urge uh, you all to refrain from living on a completely destroyed property until that property has been declared clear of hazardous waste and uh, declared safe for, uh, for you to be there. We know from other fires in California in recent years that there are a lot of concerning uh, substances and concerning levels of those substances, including heavy metals like lead and arsenic, dioxins. As the areas affected by the fire are opened up and uh, you, you have access to your properties, um, Make sure that you review the health and safety precaution for reentry packet that you'll been given. Please use the personal protective equipment that you will be given. 
Uh, Butte County and the Environmental Health Department in particular is working to secure assistance from the state and federal agencies that will ensure proper handling and disposal of the debris and ash from your properties. And that should be at no cost to the property owner. Uh, I'm up here and we bring this information to you because your health and safety and the safety of our community are the most important thing to us. So thank you. Hi, good evening. Uh, my name is Aaron Johnson and I'm a vice president of PG&E's Electric Operations Organization Department. Um, supporting our restoration efforts here in Butte County. Uh, I want to thank you for the opportunity to be here uh, and uh, give you an update on the progress that we're making on restoring your utility service and, uh, and just uh, express our, um, our uh, uh, deepest um, condolences and, and just recognition that our, our hearts are with you and, and all that you've been going through. Um, our primary focus continues to be uh, trying to make the area safe and restore uh, service in the wildfire affected areas uh, as soon as safely possible. Uh, we've been partnering with various local agencies and community leaders to prioritize restoration efforts. Uh, we've had meetings with the mayor and the city council members in Paradise as part of those uh, coordination efforts. We have uh, 3,700 employees, contractors, and mutual assistance personnel dedicated to rebuilding our gas and electric infrastructure in Butte County. Uh, we have mutual assistance from other utilities as far away as uh, Hawaii and Florida. Uh, and we are also a part of this uh, community, um, and our employees have been affected. We have 95 employees who have lost their homes, many of whom are continuing to work on this restoration effort. So tonight, I want to share with you uh, our restoration schedule. Uh, please understand that this timeline is heavily dependent on weather. We know what the weather is typically like this time of year, so we've factored that in, but obviously it will be dependent on, on what actually uh, comes. For electric service, our estimate is that we can restore power to nearly all customers who can take service by the end of the month. Um, for gas service, our estimate is to restore gas service to all those who can receive it during the first quarter of the year. It's important to note that service restoration is ongoing. And what that means is that some customers will receive gas and electric service much earlier than those dates. Uh, it's sort of, put another way, it's sort of a rolling restoration process. And so uh, customers are not all restored at a, at one at a time. It will happen sequentially. We have the resources in place to complete this work. Our biggest challenge, as I mentioned, going forward will continue to be weather and ultimately removing hazard trees uh, that are a potential danger to, to the community and also to the infrastructure that we're rebuilding. Uh, I want to share with you some of the progress we've made over the last 27 days. Uh, let's start with electric service. Um, we've uh, rebuilt the main circuit uh, in the area, in town, and restored the Paradise Electric substation. This is repowering critical areas of Paradise, including the Lower Skyway Corridor, parts of Clark Road, Paradise Town Hall, Police Station, and the Fire Station. We provided temporary power to several critical customers, including the Dell Oral Water Treatment uh, and Supply Facilities, uh, the Adventist Health Clinic, radio stations, uh, some temporary housing Sierra Nevada Brewery has in, cell towers. Uh, that's just uh, a few of the examples. Um, we are in the process of building out the smaller lines that go to the individual homes uh, and businesses uh, to power them. Uh, but again, those lines can't be re-energized re until we get all those hazard trees uh, out of the way. For natural gas service, we've completed major dam damage assessment of our facilities. Uh, as we work through the restoration process, we are providing temporary gas service for critical customers in the area. We've set up portable natural gas service to key buildings in the town of Paradise, including the town hall, uh, police and fire stations, and to the Feather River Health Center. Uh, going forward, we need to safely disconnect service from all the damaged uh, and destroyed structures before we can put gas back into the main lines. Um, as that work is completed, we will test the integrity of the main lines. Uh, we will probably find some repairs that we need to do, and then we will retest those lines as needed. Uh, once we begin restoring gas service, that will happen again sequentially uh, through the town uh, and uh, will lend itself all the way to the end of, of returning to your homes to help relight pilot lights as necessary. Uh, finally, let's, um, let's turn to your PG&E account. Uh, 
Uh, you may not be focused on this right now, but we've canceled billing in the area uh, for now. Uh, we are making adjustments uh, to bills. Uh, anyone whose home is destroyed will not receive uh, a bill for final service from PG&E. Um, for those of you that have service uh, and, and are waiting to have service restored to your homes, in the next several days, we will be getting out with announcements on how uh, we will contact you to let you know when that service is being restored and how you can contact us uh, to get more information on that uh, timing. Uh, we offer billing support, credit relief, financial assistance to customers. If you have questions, you can call our 800 number, 800-743-5000. There is a designated prompt uh, for those affected by the campfire that will take you directly to the head of the queue and connect you with customer service representatives uh, who are specializing in the kinds of uh, questions that uh, you all probably have at this time. I finally just want to echo what I've heard uh, in different public meetings from the sheriff and uh, uh, Chief Reinbold, and, uh, and that is really that there continue to be many, many vegetation hazards in the area. Uh, we are working uh, incredibly hard to uh, clear those hazards ahead of restoration and repopulation. Um, we fully understand this is a, uh, uh, the first step in a long process. We want you to know that the next step after this is the rebuilding phase. What we are currently putting in place uh, is a temporary plan, but it's really focused on getting gas and electric service back to everyone that can take service uh, as fast as possible. We are building that temporary network to our highest standards but it is that a temporary network. We are fully committed to working with the community to build the, re the infrastructure uh, in a way that reflects what the future needs are of the town of Paradise. We know that those plans will take time to develop and uh, we are here to be your partner on that, what that permanent infrastructure looks like when you're ready. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Preston Dickinson. I am an independent contractor with AT&T's External Affairs Organization. Immediately following the campfire in Paradise, we work to restore and maintain network operations and quickly and safely as, operation, as conditions allowed. We supported first responders, our customers, and affected communities with portable cell sites in affected areas as we continue to repair damaged equipment. We have and continue to remove and replace damaged cable in the Paradise area. We will continue working with PG&E to replace or transfer our equipment off damaged or destroyed poles. As we continue making repairs to our wireline network, we have prioritized our efforts to benefit the greatest number of customers. In areas that were more severely burned, it will take longer to make those restorations. Safety for our employees is of utmost importance. We are working as diligently as possible to finish repairs, and we really appreciate your patience. <clears throat> we have waived charges and bill credits and are happy to help address customers' concerns as they arise. If you are a home phone customer, we can provide remote call forwarding and a number of other waivers. If you are a home or business phone customer, I have a handout that I will be happy to provide with dedicated numbers for campfire victims. Our team is committed to continue working diligently on the extensive restoration efforts and will continue working with the Paradise community and other utilities to rebuild together. Thanks. Good evening, my name is Philip Arndt and I'm uh, Government Affairs Director for Comcast. Um, similar to AT&T, from the outset of the fire, Comcast was uh, here um, on the scene and, and up, in, up in the paradise in the burned areas restoring uh, primary transport and communication lines. Um, also providing over 51,000 Wi-Fi spots um, throughout Butte in Yuba counties, um, and also internet and, and modem service at evacuation centers and other services as well. Um, very focused on getting uh, our, our service back up to places where we can, um, and also at this point working closely with the sheriff's office, the town of Paradise, the, the police uh, chief, 
and other agencies to clear out um, many, many miles of down cable lines and other equipment. Um, making very good progress on that. We brought in hundreds of crews from throughout Northern California. Um, and like other utilities, if you're up in the area, you'll see many um, trucks, uh, Xfinity and Comcast. Our hearts go out to those um, who lost homes and affected by the fires. Um, Comcast as well had employees that were displaced and lost homes. Safety is our number one concern um, when we're, we're dealing with, with the harsh weather, um, with the uneven roads. Um, safety is of paramount concern and we're working closely with the agencies to make sure that we work, that we can work swiftly um, and safely. Finally, if uh, any issues or concerns with um, cable accounts, broadband, phone, we have been on site at the local assistance centers. Our office, our, our Chico store has been open in other areas, including the evacuation centers to help customers um, with their accounts. You can always call our Comcast number, go into a store, um, and of course, we are, we are waiving any charges and any issues come up. I'll be around this, after, uh, this evening and can answer any questions one-on-one, -on -one, but thank you. Good evening. My name is Kevin Phillips. I'm the Assistant District Manager for Paradise Irrigation District. And I'm going to give you the operational update for where Paradise Irrigation District has come and where we're at currently. Uh, during the fire, like I've said, we had to shut the whole system down to save water because all the water was leaking out of all of the broken service lines. So we shut the system down to just a main line down Skyway. Through the process since that we shut the system down, we're starting to re-energize the system. We're filling tanks, all of our tanks except for the B-Res, which is a tank up off Skyway that was burnt, is, has water in them. We have water down Clark, we have water down Pence, across from Billy, and water down Skyway to the clinic at the bottom of Skyway. Our main focus is going to be getting water back to critical infrastructure and to the homes that are still standing. I want to reinforce that if you do go back and you do have home water in your home, we are still on a boil water notice and you must boil your water before it is safe to drink. I recommend bottled water for any type of drinking water, but for flushing toilets, uh, it's that's what our water is going to be there for right now. <laughs> um, that, that boil water notice is going to be in effect for probably a long time until we figure out all of the constituents and contaminants that could be in our system due to the fact that our system depressurized and there could have been things that sucked back into the pipes that we don't know the harms to the public. Our main focus is to make sure our water is safe for you, so we will not do anything to make sure that we will not do anything until the water is safe for you to drink. So that is our main focus. I know that there's some billing issues that came out and we have our expert here that's gonna come up and talk about that. But I wanna just make sure that you guys know we are a local business. We're a local government. We're your guys' water district. And we are here to serve you and to be there for you when you guys do rebuild. And we're trying our best to figure out how to make that happen. So be patient with us. Be, uh, understand that we have issues just like everybody else, and we're trying our best to get through this. So I'm gonna introduce Mickey Rich to talk about some of the billing. Hello, my name's Mickey Rich and um, Probably most of you guys don't know me, but I have worked at the district for almost 20 years. 17 of those years has been in customer service. And so I feel like I know you. Um, it's difficult to, you know, you, you see people pay their bills every month for 20 years and you get to know personalities. You know, this is, this is Joan who lives on Pence Road and she always puts the cute little paper clips on her checks. and. Um, 
So when I see the comments and some of the pain that you guys are going through on Facebook and some of the confusion because of the bill, it hurts because I feel like I know you. And I just want to say right off the bat that I'm sorry that um, the billing has been confusing lately. And I just wanted to go over um, the current bill errors and then talk about some of the information that went out about continuing your service so that we can um, get rid of uh, some of the rumors that are going around. So the first thing is um, on December 2nd, the district issued a press release saying that we realized that there was an error in the bill that everybody received in November. Um, when the fire hit, staff was in the middle of doing the billing for your October use. Um, we got, we didn't mail that out. Um, we set up our offices in Chico and we got numerous calls from property managers wanting to release their security deposits back to tenants who really needed that money and they needed a special billing. And so we worked to do a special prorated bill for the first week of November so that we could get those amounts and the tenants could get their money back. The billing, although it was uh, for a period from October 1st to November 7th, the day before the fire, looked like it was just for one week. And so I just wanted to clear up some information about the bills. Um, no water, no fees were charged for after November 7th. Nobody was charged for water use during the fire or after. No penalties were charged for payments that weren't received. Um, and because of this error, no penalties will be charged until it's remedied. We are working with our software provider to reissue statements that will be correct and clear. The second thing I wanted to talk about was the options for continuing service as we go forward. And um, as Kevin Phillips you know, ended his statement with, we are local government. PID was formed by the citizens of Paradise in 1916 when everybody got together and said, how are we going to get water to our homes? It has always been a partnership where PID worked for the people, and it is still today the same partnership where we are working for you. What that means in a partnership and the way the history of PID has always been is that everybody, everybody pays their own way. PID does not charge you for services that you're not getting. Um, so the options that you may have heard about are the standby fee for $21.49 a month. Um, under our current policy, we only have two billing rates. We have the active rate that everybody's familiar with. You pay about $39 and then charge for the water. And then we have the standby rate, which is meant for if you're going away, you know, uh, to go, you know, explore the world for nine months and you want to come back and make sure your water's there, that uh, the meter is locked, we still maintain it, we still take care of that meter and service, and you're billed only half of that service charge. And then when you want to come back, you turn it on. You call us and we come turn the water on. That is the default rate that we've moved everybody to. Um, no one has been charged that rate yet, and we don't know when that rate will start. Um, we have, um, you have a board of directors who's gonna be discussing some of the billing issues and how to make sure that you guys have a solid and de dependable water district, but aren't hurt at the same time. The second option is to disconnect completely. And I went back through the records uh, and was trying to come to terms with the fact, you know, why is this so hard to explain to people? Well, it's because it's new for us. Right now, we're getting a lot of people saying they just want to disconnect and they want to leave. Well, in the last two years, we've had four people disconnect from the district. It just doesn't happen that often. And so to have all the customers up and say, we're done and we want to leave, Actually, it's not that many, but to have as many as we have, we don't have an answer to, you know, people want to know what it's going to cost if they disconnect and want to come back. And so I found some information from our current policy, and this is what it says. Um, 
The current district policy states that when a customer disconnects, it is permanent. And when water is requested at the property in the future, the requesting owner would pay the same fees as a new connect, with an exception that the owner shall retain the capacity previously provided. So what that means is if when you built your home, you paid the $3,500 for a three quarter inch meter, you don't have to pay that again. If you want to permanently disconnect your meter, you'll be able to do that. And um, when you come back, you'll only need to pay the actual cost to put that meter back in the ground. Having said that, um, I'm not disconnecting. And I'm not encouraging people to disconnect because this is our district. And this is our system that we are going to take care of together. And I, we had um, 10,500 meters that we served before this fire. And when this is through and we all get to go home, I want to see that number just as high. So it gives me hope that my neighbors are coming home and I'm going to have my community. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Tony Signorelli, Deputy Insurance Commissioner with the California Department of Insurance. Uh, insurance, as you're learning, is a complex issue. There are a lot of challenges. It is going to take some time to get through the process. But for now, uh, we wanted to just give you some initial tips. There will be other opportunities either at the local assistance center where we have staff on site. You can go visit them and, and ask specific questions and they could even refer you to more information that we have online. And in a, uh, if, you're, if you arrive at an impasse with your insurance case and your claim, then they can set up a, a request for assistance, like a complaint or an inquiry, or we can assign it to one of our experts and we can look further into it and get a resolution of that particular issue. And then we'll also, to the degree that issue is resolved, and you move on and you'd run to another issue, let's say a month down the road, you can come back and we'll still have that information so we're not starting from scratch. But the first thing, obviously, is to file your claim. Most people have done that. Uh, I met some people over the weekend that had not done it. They said they were waiting uh, to do it, but uh, I encourage everyone to start that clock, start the insurance company's clock of their obligation to communicate with you hopefully get access to the property, which is a slow process in some areas, but that, that's opening up, and discuss with you your coverages, your various coverages, what your limits are, what your obligations might be, and also what your, their obligations might be, as well as giving you advance money. Get a complete copy of your insurance policy. It's a complex contract. The insurance company is obligated to give you a copy of that policy within 30 days upon your request. So the sooner you request it, the sooner you can get it. Many companies are out there already distributing policies and giving them out to their customers. But just let's make sure that you ask for it so that you can start that clock from making sure you get your policy within that period of time because you want to refer to it uh, as the claim goes forward. Also, start a claims diary. You're going to be meeting with a lot of different claims adjusters. You've been making a lot of phone calls. You'll be dealing with email and in-person meetings. And you'll want to keep a, a good diary of who you're meeting with, what was discussed, what was agreed to, what was not agreed to, uh, so that you can use that down the road. And, and especially if you do run into an impasse where you need to contact us and file a complaint, uh, we'll have a better uh, documentation trail to be able to better assist you. Uh, about a week after the, the fires, we, uh, Christopher Jones issued a, an initial notice to insurance companies asking them to give advance monies out. So, that, and I'm talking about homeowners insurance for the moment. Uh, part of that request was 25% of your contents without having to do an inventory, four months of additional living expense coverage uh, up front. Many companies are doing that. A few of them uh, aren't, but almost all of them that we're aware of have, have done that. Um, and that, that's another reason to file your claim. The sooner you file your claim, the sooner you can get that advance money. In addition, just uh, yesterday, we issued a, a, an additional notice to insurance companies requesting that they offer 
at least 75% of your content coverage without an inventory. There are some companies uh, offering 75% uh, now, some are offering more than 75%, uh, and that's great. Uh, the commissioner is now making a request that all of them uh, consider that. We, we don't have the statutory authority to require them to do it, but in the last fires, we did get a good response from insurance companies, and they did up it from the 25% initial advance that they were giving people to a higher amount, 50, 75, and again, some 100%. If you're not sure what your company's, you know, please ask what their, what their percentage is. If you think that uh, you should get more or that there's an issue with the, the burden of the inventory, contact us. We could, we could either help you through that process or uh, maybe work with that company to make their requirements more flexible for you to get your funds. Additional coverage is additional living expense coverage. So now that's going to, uh, many of you have a set dollar amount, let's say 50000 or 100000 or whatever that number is. Because it's a disaster, uh, laws trigger where you can get two years and in some cases three years of additional living expense coverage. But that doesn't change your coverage amount. So if you have 100000 of additional living expense coverage, you're going to get additional time to be able to use it but it doesn't change that amount, so you're going to have to manage that amount uh, as best you can. Um, I know in the front end, in the first few weeks and a month, that's going to be a, uh, not as easy because you're going to be, it's, it's, a, it's a shock and there, there's not a lot of uh, options available to you, so you're going to spend more on the front end. But as you get further down the road, start thinking about how you can manage that, that amount. Uh, other, other policies don't have a cap, uh, so it's really, uh, a benefit in that sense, but you, you'll need to work with your insurance company as to uh, what amount they're willing to pay you for rental and other additional expenses that you incur. Um, contractors, obviously, you know, you're going to be inundated with all kinds of contractors wanting to rebuild and remove debris and, and do all kinds of things. Uh, Number one, vet them, make sure they're licensed, contact the contract state license board, make sure they have a, a valid license, make sure they have insurance, and make sure you have, they're following the contract laws, and if you have questions, contact the contract or state license board, and they will be in the area, they have been in the area, along with our fraud investigators, making sure that the uh, people that are out there soliciting services are in fact licensed and are uh, soliciting within the required, uh, uh, you know, laws that are in effect. Uh, there's also uh, what are called public adjusters. Uh, you have an insurance adjuster who's, who works for the insurance company, and then there are uh, private public adjusters that are also licensed by the department that are there to help you should you run into an impasse and need their help. Um, number one, feel free if you want to use their services, contact are us, you can go online uh, and contact us to see if they have a valid license, make sure they have a valid license. I, I would recommend though, if you have a total loss, um, you're probably going to get a, a significant amount of money without the need for a public adjuster. And since the public adjuster is gonna take a commission, um, there's really no need for them to take a commission off the money that you'd be able to get on your own uh, through the normal process. When you, when you do get as much as you think you can get and you then are at an impasse, then it might be a really good reason to, to hire a public adjuster and make sure that they're only trying to get a commission for the additional amount that they get you. And so just keep that in mind. You're, you're gonna hear about debris removal. Uh, you have a debris, most people with insurance will have debris removal coverage on their policy. You're gonna also be, uh, uh, inundated or solicited by private debris removal companies. Uh, our recommendation is that you, that you listen to the consolidated debris removal program and it, from our point of view, it's going to be much more financially beneficial to you to go through the uh, consolidated debris removal program uh, for a lot of different reasons and there'll be a lot of other meetings to discuss that in more detail, but you probably will start to be inundated with uh, flyers and people saying opt out, opt out, but please uh, uh, listen to all the information before you make an informed decision. Uh, a number of new laws go into effect 
uh, after a declared disaster. Uh, you know, if you only have 12 months of additional living expense, that's two years. Now it's three years with a new law. Um, before, you only used to have one year to rebuild in order to get full replacement costs. Now that's two years, so you have more time. And so that, that'll assist you in, in getting that money. And um, another law is in effect that it's something to consider is if you, most people have a full replacement cost policy, but initially you only get what's called actual cash value, which is a depreciated amount. It's called fair market value. It's, you know, it's the price of a, a comparable home minus the value of your land, and they'll give you that up front until you rebuild, then you get the difference. Um, the law is that you can get that full replacement cost, and that includes your extended replacement costs, your building code upgrades, and all of the uh, rebuild costs that it would take to rebuild the home on that lot, even if you choose to rebuild on a different lot, or if you choose to purchase a new home somewhere. As long, so if, you're, if your math works out on your rebuild of your current home that was destroyed, is, let's say $400,000, if you spend $400,000 to rebuild on another lot, or on a replacement home, you're eligible to get that full amount. So make sure that when you're talking to your adjuster, you know, you might hear otherwise because there are some adjusters who are coming in because of the influx of large numbers of claims that there may be, uh, they may not be as familiar with these laws as they should be and keep that in mind. So you, um, and, and again, we're always here as a source to help you through that process if you run into any questions. And just lastly, I mean, please visit our staff um, or contact us at our 800 number. That's 800-927-HELP. Uh, or you can contact us online. Uh, we have brochures at the local assistance center in Oroville and in Chico. Um, and, you know, we can't help everybody. There's going to be a lot of different challenges. But we certainly can't help you if you don't contact us. So please contact us. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Diane Brown. I'm the Butte County Assessor. A lot of you still have questions about how the calamity process works. Um, what happens is you're going to pay taxes on your structure for the first four months of the year because it was there for the first four months of the year, and then we'll remove it as of November 1st. And so it'll get removed for the last eight months of the year. We are just now starting to the correction process to issue new bills. We went to Paradise today and cleaned out our Paradise office, so we now have all of our records in Oroville. So if your insurance adjuster needs a copy of your floor plan or a part of your record in order to justify their, their assessment, um, come into the Orville office. We are waiving the copy fees for the affected properties, and so you can just come in and get a copy of your record for free. There is a firm right now out of Southern California <coughs> that is offering property profiles and recorded deeds for a fee of $86. Right now, the recorder's office is waiving their copy fees for any damaged documents so you can go to the recorder's office, either at the recovery center or in the office, to replace your documents free of charge. You can come into my office and get a copy of your property profile free of charge. So you can pay these people $86 for doing what you can do for free, or you can do it yourself. So just be careful. There's, the vultures are circling and ready to take advantage of you. So just be really careful where you get your information. If you have any questions about anything, go to the source. If you have questions about the rebuilding and calamity process, contact my office. If you have questions about anything else, contact those people. We're trying to get the rumors stopped and the right information out there. So my num the number in the office is 552-3800. That's my main line. So feel free to call at any time. And have a nice night. Good evening. Uh, my name is Mark Gallarducci. I'm director of your state's Office of Emergency Services. 
And um, we've been here with, with you all from the beginning of uh, the fire, and we are coordinating the overall state and federal response to the fires and, and working to get the community cleaned up and rebuilt and helping all of you get your lives back going again. Uh, let me start out by just saying a couple things. First of all, what you just heard about unscrupulous people giving you information or entities reaching out to you is really correct. You have to be very cognizant of that. Um, there are going to be everybody who wanting to uh, represent you, to uh, wanting to give you information for a fee, uh, and just know that uh, the reason why the local assistance center, the disaster recovery center is here, is to give you an opportunity to have a one-stop place to you go get information, um, th th which is correct information. There's going to be information on uh, the Butte County Recovery.org website, uh, which links to the state website at OES, which also gives you information. Um, there will be people throughout the region from OES and FEMA working with the county and the town. Uh, we will be here for the long run that you can ask questions for. So all I'm going to say is it's really important that before you agree to take any money out of your pocket to hire anybody or to represent you, check with one of us first so that we can make sure that we give you uh, the best information on that. Um, we have been working very, very diligently um, with the, the, the county and the town. Uh, we have put a number of state task forces in place everything from shelter management and, and then housing, what we're gonna do in the short run, in the long run, and you'll hear in a little bit from our partners at FEMA uh, who are working with us on, on housing solution. We know that we have um, a, a very wide demographic of individuals that live in the town of Paradise. Uh, we have seniors and we have pe people with access and functional needs and, and we have we, we want to make sure that we get the right housing solution for each of you. Um, and my, my goal is to get, if you're still in a shelter, is to get you out of that shelter and into uh, either a hotel, a rental, or one of our um, uh, housing solutions, whether it's going to be a mobile home or some other kind of uh, travel trailer or fifth wheel, something that gets you into, out of that shelter and into a place that you can call an interim home uh, until we can get your home built again. We also are working with our schools uh, within the region. Uh, as you know, those kids should be gone back to school today. Um, the key thing here is to um, address uh, the needs of the schools so that, 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 the, that the, the kids and all the way up through high school um, have a place to get some sort of normalcy back in, in, in their lives and, and continue on with their education. Uh, there's a lot of effort going on uh, uh, to address the losses of the schools in, in Paradise uh, and be able to get those uh, addressed kind of early on so that we can, we can address that issue. Also, we've got a task force on watershed. As you know, uh, uh, living in Paradise, you, you live in an area where the watershed is important, the, the environment is important, and so we're working on that to address uh, much of the loss and, and not only make it, render it safe again so that you can move back in, but also to address um, reforestation, et cetera. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the debris program, because I know that that's high on everybody's thought. And, and Tony was right when he talked about uh, participating in a consolidated debris program. First of all, this debris program is going to be the largest debris operation that the state has ever seen. Now, last year, I said that when I was in Sonoma that that was the largest debris operation that the state had ever seen. Um, actually, uh, it was bigger than uh, since, we, since the 1906 earthquake. And when we were all said and done with that operation, we removed um, enough debris to make two Golden Gate bridges, if you could imagine. In this case, we are at least four times as much debris, OK? So as you can see, um, uh, it will take a, a, a Herculean effort to be able to um, effectively, safely, uh, and, and rapidly get all the debris out of the, out of the area. Um, actually today, um, uh, state, federal, and local teams actually have already been deployed 
uh, initially to go in and address what we call the household hazardous waste. That's going to be your paints and pesticides and propane and any kind of hazardous material that's there. We consider that a public health hazard and, and the idea is, is to clear that, could be some asbestos there, clear that off before we actually begin uh, the debris program. And there's the, the, the teams that are going up are specially trained hazmat teams uh, that are, that are going to be moving through the area and it's going to take um, roughly four to six months to be able to clear all the household hazardous waste. Now that doesn't mean that we're going to wait on the debris operation for the hazmat teams to clear. We're going to continue to sort of do it concurrently. They move pretty rapidly once they get started. Um, but the difference is, is that um, uh, the teams that go in, the hazmat teams that go in, go in under a public health emergency, they clear the lot. The second phase is actually removing the debris. And to actually remove the debris, it requires your participation. And it starts out with you filling out a right of entry form, which I understand are here tonight uh, for you to get, but also you'll be able to get them on the website, um, the county website, uh, buttecountyrecovery.org, um, and, and we will make sure that you get those forms. That right of entry form allows the state um, and its contractors to go in and remove all of the debris. And um, I know there's a number of questions, and I've got some debris specialists here that afterwards will, will answer your specific questions. But um, understand that um, uh, this, is, this is, a, it, it, it is a lot of challenges to be able to get this debris out in a timely fashion. Um, we're looking, you know, last year, statewide, we had about 10,000 structures that we had to remove debris on. That was from from Mendocino down to Santa Barbara. This year, in this fire alone, we have close to 18,000, maybe a little bit more structures just on the campfire alone. So there's a lot of things to think about. There's, um, there's uh, limited routes in and out. Uh, we will have thousands of trucks that will be moving debris up and down the highway. We will have heavy machinery, equipment, front end loaders and dozers um, to be able to pick up all that debris. Um, and then we will move all that debris down to a place where we will segregate all of the concrete, all of the metal and steel, and then all of the ash. And we will recycle the metal and steel, and we will um, recycle the concrete, and we'll remove the ash to um, appropriate landfills. And it may not be that the landfill here in town, in fact, it most likely won't be used uh, to that high of a degree because it's limited. So we will be moving the debris uh, at landfills in other parts of the state or possibly out of the state. Um, so um, uh, this will all be done in, in, in a couple of phases. The first phase, of course, is like I say, the household hazardous waste. And that is being done, and you'll hear a little bit in a minute, uh, by a combination of a state and federal agencies. Department of Toxics, Substance, Substance Control, uh, and the United States Environmental Protection Agency working together to go in and remove the household hazardous waste. And then the second phase, uh, which will probably start around January the 7th, will be um, the uh, debris removal, which will be handled by Cal Recycle, another state agency, but managed overall by OES. Um, and, um, and so what will happen is that the, um, uh, that effort will probably take close to um, a year to be able to get through all of that uh, debris. Um, now, it'll be moving throughout um, the town. And of course, it's not just Paradise. It's part of Concow, Megalia, et cetera. Uh, that will have to be be um, done, and I and I, as Tony mentioned, um, I, I highly encourage uh, everybody to participate in this program. It was very very successful in Sonoma. Um, I will just tell you that in Sonoma, uh, with with uh, they had about seven thousand structures uh, in Sonoma proper, um, another almost thousand in Mendocino, and another thousand in Napa. Uh, we were able to get through all that within about eight months. And um, in actuality, Coffee Park, which, which had about 2,000 structures, 
uh, is already about 75 to 80 percent rebuilt. So I will tell you that um, all working together, you know, one team, one fight effort, all of us together, local, state, and federal, all of you in the community, um, um, we, we can get through this. And um, we're going to do everything to continue to support um, the town of Paradise to get back up on their feet and get rebuilt. That is our objective and our goal. And we're gonna help Butte County uh, make sure that they have all the resources uh, that they need to be able to effectively uh, manage the overall recovery effort. So um, uh, the governor has already, um, in his um, uh, emergency declaration and a number of executive orders, waived all the regulations, all the impediments that could possibly be in place to ensure that we rapidly uh, start this recovery process. And, um, uh, and so, just so you know, we, we'll, we'll continue to be here with you uh, to the end, um, and we have people that are that are based here. There's there's several thousand responders. Um, we have them mostly over in a base camp by the airport. Uh, we made sure that we cleared all those responders out of hotels so that we could open up hotel spaces uh, for uh, fire survivors to get out of shelters and into hotels. And we want to make sure that you know that we will be here through throughout the duration. So um, we'll take questions afterwards, but. Um, Thank you very much. Good evening. My name is Steve Kalanog. I'm with the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. And as, as Mark described, we're working here in a joint effort with the California Department of Toxics and Substance Control and Butte County Environmental Health. Um, our, our job here, as Mark described, is to begin the first phase of the debris removal program, which is the removal of household hazardous waste. It's our HAZMAT teams. Uh, it's a joint effort of federal, state, and local resources that began work this week to assess damaged properties for the presence and removal of household hazardous waste. We're doing this work in close coordination with the Town of Paradise and uh, Butte County officials. Uh, in particular, Butte, uh, the Town of Paradise Police Department. Um, we are only doing this work in neighborhoods where evacuation orders have been lifted and at a time where residents have had the opportunity to visit their property, assess and retrieve any belongings or materials that they wish to take. Um, as Dr. Miller indicated, this, this phase of work is uh, at no cost to the property owners. Um, and. Um, uh, again, we're, we're coordinating with uh, local agencies. Um, beginning this week, we, we started with approximately 15 teams, hazmat teams, and that will ramp up quickly to 20 and, and, and more in the coming weeks. Um, Mark also described that our objectives to be done in four to six months, and we'll endeavor to do so barring uh, unforeseen circumstances. Uh, a question you may have is when do I know uh, my property has been cleared. There will be several ways for you to determine that. The most obvious is we'll post a sign uh, in the front of the yard that will say that we have done this work. It will have the EPA and uh, DTSC logos on it. There will be a number on it, but we'll also post a hotline in, in a variety of different for, uh, forums, social media and, and otherwise. And we'll, we'll also have a, a website where you'll be able to, to actually look at your parcel of property and determine what's the status of it as, as we move through there. Um, and that's all I have. Thank you. Hi, I'm Doug Danz. I work for Butte County Environmental Health. And our role in this is working integrally with the federal and state government agencies um, for different aspects. And then one aspect I wanted to add um, some thoughts to was the debris removal program. Um, personally, I, I lost my house as well, uh, as, as a lot of you have. So I'm kind of very familiar and fortunate because I've seen this process work um, in the prior fires that we had here in the county. Um, also, we have evidence from Sonoma County that this process really works, the debris remo removal process. Um, just one or two takeaways, maybe you guys can relate to this as far as having your house burned down. Um, three things. One, 
when your daughter says, hey, maybe we should take the cat with us, and you say, oh, he's an outside cat, he'll be okay, you're probably wrong on that point. Um, we had a good outcome with this, so no problem there. The another one, when your wife says, do you think I can take a shower? It's okay to yell, no, we have to go. She's, she's forgiven me for that because in about 15 more minutes, our house was in flames, and we did get out on time, like, like, like everyone here. Um, the last one is, it's probably not a good idea to leave your leaf blower on top of your pile of firewood. It had a full tank, and I know that firewood's gone. It's just ashes right now. So that was a dumb idea. I remember driving out of the driveway going, huh, maybe I should move that, and it was too late. So I know that all of you can relate to that, and the point and the takeaway on this is that we weren't expecting this. No one here was expecting this. And now we have some issues, and we have some problems, and our, our health officer described those as far as public health issues. The ash and debris that we have there is considered hazardous, um, and we need to be careful with it, how we interact with it, what we do when we're touching it, and, 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 and what our responsibility as a homeowner is regarding that hazardous substance that's left on the ground. The debris and ash removal program addresses that thoroughly. It actually takes this problem off our list of things to do. As it was described, the hazardous waste is being removed as we speak. The second phase, which has been described, is the debris and ash removal phase. And that has to be accomplished, or is only accomplished, if you actually sign a right of entry authorization form. Um, as was discussed, we have those forms here tonight, and they're going to be everywhere. They're going to be on our website, ucountyrecovers.org. Um, they're going to be at the Environmental Health um, Office in Oroville. They're going to be at the DRC, um, which is the, the Disaster Response Center in Chico. Um, you can go online and download it and read through it and sign it. You can actually scan it and email it to us. But you can also bring it into the ROE. And by the way, that ROE is its right, um, right of entry authorization form. That's what it stands for. You can sign it and download it, um, send it to us that way. But we encourage people to come into the ROE Center. It's at 202 Mira Loma Drive. And the address is at the bottom here. And, and, and ask questions and, and kind of figure out what this means and what these different pages might mean. There might be um, some, some questions that you have about it. We're, we're glad to answer those questions. I know that you probably have a lot of questions yourself right now, and I know that they're sending out f forms where you can do it, and we'll try to get to those. But the bottom line is that we weren't planning this. And we now, as owners, have a responsibility to, to see that our, our lot is clean of the ash and debris. And if we use this program offered by the federal and state government, that it will be taken care of. I've seen it work. And the outcome is, is it's way cheaper. And it's also a quicker method of getting our building permits if we're rebuilding. We can put our community back together, and we can put our lives back together. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Kevin Hannes, and I'm the Deputy Federal Coordinating Officer uh, for the, this event, and I'm also the Senior Federal Official here for Butte County in relationship to the Camp Fire. Um, I'm going to start off with just a few little statistics because I'm from the federal government and we love statistics, and so I want to provide those to you real quick. To date, in Butte County, so those impacted directly by the Camp Fire, over $32.5 million has been authorized by FEMA to residents of the impacted area. Over $28 million has been approved by the Small Business Administration for the same amount. So right there, we're trying to start getting those, those funds back into your hands. 5,764 families are receiving some form of rental assistance. 147 families are currently residing in our TSA hotels and 116 have resided with us and have already checked out and found a, a, a suitable interim living source. 
Average grant right now uh, for the campfire is a little over $10,000. And let me tell you how significant that is. Hurricane Harvey, which I was the, fire, the federal coordinating officer for, our average grant was 4,500. This was a devastating event. And, and the numbers are starting to reflect that. And we are preparing to make sure that we have the assistance you need for those. 372 families have already received our maximum grant. So I know a lot of questions are about housing and what are we going to do about housing. So I'm going to give you really what you need to hear at this point, maybe not what you want to hear. But I will always do that to you uh, in, in fairness and transparency is, is tell you what you need to hear to make informed decisions and understand the process. FEMA is just one part of the housing solution. It's really an interim solution, whether it's the sheltering, our hotel program, our rental assistance, or if needed, manufactured housing units and travel trailers. Those are interim solutions. We have to find solutions that get you from the shelter to a secure, habitable solution that's interim, and then onward to the long-term full rebuild solution. And we are going to be here with you for that. I know there's a lot of question of where are the FEMA trailers? When are they coming? Are they already here and you're putting in folks? Um, there are some individuals in some uh, remote counties, not in Butte County, that have already been placed into some travel trailers. Uh, we looked first to commercial sites. Uh, we looked from Redding to Sacramento, down that corridor, and found 107 available pads. It's tough. And so we're looking to get those pads uh, and put trailers on those uh, and move people in as quickly as we can. But we are very conscious of where those pads are at and work with you on your needs. If that need doesn't fit your work or school, we will look for another source for you. And so we, I want to assure people we're not going to start moving people to Nevada or to Southern California. We are looking to keep individual families here as close to Butte County as we can. And that offers a lot of challenges. We have to ensure that, one, that there's a need. I know there will be a need, but we have to go through that process. We have to be good stewards of your tax dollars. This isn't FEMA money. This is really your tax dollars at work. Much like Social Security or Medicaid or Medicare, it's money you're putting into the system, and now it's time for that system to come back and support you. We want to be good stewards of that and make sure we make the right decisions, find the right solutions, as your state director said, to ensure that we get the outcomes that you need. So we have to ensure that the county, local governments have the right ordinances in place. We have to ensure that there's power, water, sewage available to hook these units up so that they are safe and secure. That takes a while to assess those properties. Once we've identified that as a need, we've identified the property. To build a site to house travel trailers will take anywhere from 30 to 45 days. To build a site for manufactured housing units could take upwards of four months. Now, we're not going to wait until the whole site is built before we move people in. We will do it in phases and move people in. ALE, the ad, uh, additional living expense, was uh, brought up by your insurance commissioner. If you are using your ALE right now, that does not prevent you from being a potential applicant for our direct housing mission. What we will do is if you have a need, to be in our direct housing mission, we will actually charge you the fair market rent for that so you're using your ALE so we do not have a d potential duplication of benefits. If your ALE runs out and you're still with us, then you stop paying rent. That doesn't mean you can use ALE to go do other stuff with. You've got to use it for what it's designed for so we don't have a duplication of benefits. It is important to know that this is not a federal recovery. This is a state of California and more importantly a Butte County recovery. We are here in direct support of the Governor's Office of Emergency Services. They are our client. You are our client. We are here to achieve the outcomes that you desire. We are looking at many sites. We are very close to making decisions on several sites. And once we have everything in place where we know we can break ground and we can start that construction, we will start announcing those sites. But in the interim, you will receive a call from FEMA talking about your housing needs. Please go through that call. It takes about 25 to 30 minutes. 
Give us the information. Where are you living now? Are you precariously housed? Are you with friends and family and Thanksgiving didn't go so well and you're not anticipating a great Christmas with them and so you may have to move out? Or maybe the party on the 1st of January was a little bit too much and they threw you out. Stay in contact with us. These are issues we need to know so that we can make sure that you are adequately housed going forward with this process. Let me close with this. I said this at the first uh, town hall meeting. I know what it's like to lose a house to a fire. I don't know what it's like to lose a whole town. But I do know what it's like to build a whole town. Because we've done it before, as uh, Director Galaducci said, uh, this agency, in coordination with Cal OES, is here to ensure that not only Paradise, Concow, Megalia will rise from the ashes. May God bless you all. Well, good evening, everybody. It's only been Gallagher here. Um, and first, I just want to say that uh, my heart goes out to all of you uh, who are going through a very difficult time right now. And I want you to know that uh, myself and my staff um, are going to be with you through this time. We're in this for the long haul with you. Um, and we've been working hard with all of your, your local representatives, uh, all the way on up to our federal representatives to ensure that we have the tools we need to, to rebuild, and we are going to do that. Um, so uh, I want to help, help you guys understand that uh, uh, I know this is taking longer than anybody would like in terms of getting back into your properties and starting that process. Uh, but as you heard here tonight, it, uh, you know, you've heard a lot of information tonight, but I just want to summarize a few things. One, there's a lot of people uh, working very hard, uh, you know, long hours to get this back into a place where we can start the rebuild, start the recovery process. Um, all the utilities folks, your sheriff, uh, who has been amazing through this whole uh, ordeal and working hard. <laughs> sheriff Oney. And Chief Reibold there in the back as well from Paradise. Uh, the effort that's been made by uh, their force has been nothing short of amazing and Cal Fire and everything that they've done. Um, uh, but the utilities and everybody who's working hard to bring the infrastructure back up online. Um, so please be patient with that because they're trying to make sure that it's, it's going to be ready for us to do this process. Um, please sign up with FEMA. You know, I, I understand the, the distrust of government, you know, and there's many times that... Uh, I think we have good reason to distrust government. Um, but going into this process, um, I think number one, it's important to sign up with FEMA, whether you have insurance or not. If you have insurance, still sign up because there's resources that are gonna be available to you. Um, there's even the, the small, business, uh, small Business Loan Association is, also has resources available to people. So sign up with FEMA so that you can take advantage of those, those resources. Um, <clears throat> You've heard a lot about the insurance. Go through and make your claim. Make sure that you're keeping on top of that process. Um, I did get word um, about, uh, you know, one of the insurance companies, uh, Merced, you know, and I'm, I'm sure many of you have heard that, that covered a lot of people up here on the ridge uh, that's, you know, going out of business. Um, and I know there's a lot of concern about that. Um, we are working on that issue with the uh, insurance commissioner. One good bit of news is that from my understanding the uh, California Insurance Guarantee Association will cover up to 500,000 that will guarantee the coverage of that claim up to $500,000 so um, that's that's a good thing that we have that program here in California um, for licensed insurance companies um, but we're going to continue to work through that issue I know that's been a concern on a lot of people's minds um, I introduced my first two bills yesterday, um, and principal co-authors on that are Senator Nielsen and Assemblyman Daly as well. One is to cover the local cost share of the debris removal, um, and the other one is to uh, ensure that these agencies can continue to have the uh, revenue to move forward and continue the recovery process, your towns, your school districts, your water districts, um, so that we can continue to move this forward. As you've heard, you know, obviously the revenue is not there to continue this effort, so 
the state, you know, we're going to ask them to be a partner in this and help and get us through this time. Um, I want to say something a little about the debris removal. It's been reiterated a few times, but from all the folks that I've talked to, um, probably signing up with FEMA and with Cali OES for their, for their debris removal program is probably going to be the cheapest option and will end with you having a certificate saying that your property is clear and ready to be uh, moved on. And there's, there's some flyers back there. Um, it is your right to decide to opt out um, and not do that. But if you, if you do, um, there's a lot of things you need to make sure that uh, you check the box on. If you're going to use uh, your own contractor, are they licensed? You know, do they have workers comp? Do they have uh, personal liability insurance? Are they an established business? And, and do they have hazmat certification? Because at the end of the deal, if you can't certify that that hazmat has been certified, you're going to have problems in your rebuild process. Um, so uh, you know, it's your decision to do what you want to do with your property. Um, but I think in this instance, it looks like uh, utilizing this program that's available to you uh, to clear your property and go through that process is, is looking like the best option. Um, and I know they're working hard on making sure that they're going to have the contractors and the capacity ready to start doing that work. Um, I know many of you are anxious to do that. So, uh, you know, please keep, you know, keep that in mind as you're moving forward and making decisions. We're going to continue to try and get out as much uh, up-to-date and accurate information for you. Uh, so certainly follow us on our, all of our networks, but keep, keep abreast of what of Butte Recovers and that website. Uh, there's been a lot of great information out on that as well. Um, so with that, I just, you know, uh, again, we're here with you for the long haul. Uh, we're going to continue to work hard to, I know this is a long road and, and you know, for many of you, you're, you're wondering about what that next step is. Um, but we are going to be here, your local, all the way on up to the federal uh, government. I've been talking with Congressman LaMalfa uh, to ensure that the federal aid comes on, on board as well. Um, and uh, we've had conversations with the governor and the governor-elect uh, who have said they, they are committed to helping us get through this recovery process. So um, there's a lot of people all the way on up working to do that. Um, and with that, we'll get to you know, I'll turn it over. I think you guys have, probably have a lot of questions. So uh, thank you for being here tonight. Good evening, my name is Casey Hatcher. I'm a public information officer for Butte County. We have used some cards tonight to gather questions and you have a lot of them and we know that and we want to answer as many as we can. What we have done is we have taken your questions and we have gone through them and we have combined them because there were a lot of duplicates. So what I have asked the speakers to do is take a look at the questions that you have presented for them and to answer them. And if you still have very specific questions left to your situation after this, we will stick around and we will be here to answer those for you specifically. So I'm going to invite Sheriff Corey Honey and um, Chief Eric Ramble up to answer your questions specifically related to the ongoing evacuations and when you can come back. Uh, guys, thank you. Good evening. So uh, you've heard Chief talk and uh, um, he and I decided to come up here together to answer the questions that are more within our particular wheelhouse. And we're going to do it together because um, we've stood shoulder to shoulder through this entire thing to uh, try to manage the situation and provide for the, uh, the community safety. Uh, and I think it's fitting that we uh, stand here together and answer the questions to the best of our ability. Now, as you know, there's a lot of questions, uh, and many of them are very similar in nature. So we're going to uh, speak to those questions, and then if there's something specific, uh, perhaps we can talk about it when the chief and I are done. And uh, I'll start with a list of questions that I have that are, I think are specific to the county, and the chief's got some for uh, the unincorporated or for the the town of Paradise, um, and then we'll weigh in on each other's questions as as, it see, as we see fit. Okay. All right. So the first question is, uh, on what legal grounds are you keeping people from their property? It's a great question. No, it's a very good question. 
And I'm glad you asked it because it, it allows us to tell you this first and foremost. We don't want to keep you from your property. In all candor, the chief and I really, really want this process to go as quickly and smoothly as possible so that we can get you back into the area so that you can assess your property, do the things that you need to do to start on the road to recovery. I can assure you that uh, us keeping people out of this area is not arbitrary, it's not capricious. Every single day we work very, very hard to push appropriately uh, all of those entities who are working to make this area safe to do it as quickly as we possibly can. That said, there is actual legal authority for us to do what we do. And first off, uh, under California Penal Code Section 409.5, I, as the sheriff of the county, have the authority to order an evacuation and keep people out of an area where a disaster has occurred and there's an ongoing threat to public safety. The chief has the same authority within the town of Paradise, which is the jurisdiction that he oversees. In addition to that, there's something called the Emergency Services Act, uh, which uh, uh, allows us to do that or, or uh, aids us in, in uh, that authority. And finally, there's this notion or concept of this general police power that counties and cities have with regard to uh, protecting their communities. Uh, there's a whole body of case law that supports that. But I will reiterate to you that we want nothing more than to be able to uh, open this up and allow you to get back in there. It's not something that we relish. And quite frankly, we take a lot of heat and a lot of, uh, a, a lot of abuse. I understand everybody's frustrated uh, for doing what we uh, are obligated to do and what our duty is to do under the, under the law, okay? The next question, actually there's two questions kind of along this line, um, but uh, I'll, I'll take this because it really deals more with access into the unincorporated area of Miguelia. And that is, what is the progress of having access to Miguelia from Chico, not via Butte Meadows? Now, I want to tell you, I understand the hardship that it creates for everybody to have to access Miguelia uh, up Skyway through Butte Meadows over to Highway 32. We thought a lot about that. Uh, there was discussion about whether or not we should keep Miguelia closed completely until we were able to open up a thoroughfare through the town of Paradise. But in the end, there was a lot of pressure from the public to be able to get in there. And so we opened it up, <laughs> providing people with that option. We encouraged people not to go back if getting out through that, uh, that uh, thoroughfare would be too arduous or, or hard for them, understanding that there were other people who could make that trip. That said, from the very moment, we've been working very, very hard to get the uh, passage from the valley through Paradise uh, up into Miguelia. I have to tell you, we've pushed hard on that, haven't we? Um, to, the, to the point where there's times where um, uh, we've had some very tense discussions with the people, uh, the utility companies and the people that are working to make this safe. But at the end of the day, we can't open up or say that an area is open uh, until our stakeholder partners, the utility companies, public works, the people who remove trees, tell us that, it, that they have reached a minimal degree of safety. I say minimal degree of safety because there are still hazards that are gonna be present when you are allowed to return to your house. And I think all of these people have talked about this. So that said, I'm very optimistic that within the next day or so, we are gonna be able to open up the Pence Road corridor so that people can access Miguelia through the Pence Road corridor. I have a high degree of optimism. We're gonna meet again tomorrow morning at eight o'clock uh, to see where we're at. But the reason that I can't tell you a date or time certain, and this will lead into some other questions, is that there are a lot of factors that go into play. And there are times when something will come up that no one knew about or was unforeseen that result in us having to push back our uh, timeline to open an area up. Case in point, the storm that came through and flooded uh, an entire area, uh, that set us back. Uh, when you get into some of these uh, areas where there is more infrastructure, uh, greater damage to the infrastructure, sometimes they'll find it. For example, the culverts, right? Yeah, yeah they just dis discovered that the culverts were burned out. So that said, we give you the best estimate we can, but I can tell you that we really want to get a thoroughfare open. 
I believe uh, strongly that in a very short period of time, we're going to have pence open, and that will take care of that particular problem. Let me add on to that. Please do. Something I wanted to add to the Pence Road corridor when that is open, I forgot to mention earlier, so I apologize. Uh, the first 24 hours, again, is going to be for residents only. After that 24 hour period, that will be the thoroughfare to get from the valley to Megalia. So, having said that, a lot of people have asked, well, we heard the town has adopted a curfew for the the affected area for the entire town. We have adopted a curfew and we will enforce that firmly but reasonably. The curfew is from 8 p.m. to 6 a.m. So if people are traveling on Pence Road and you get pulled over by one of our officers, we're just determining who you are and what you're doing and we're doing that for all of you. So don't be surprised, but we want to limit the amount of stragglers and people that shouldn't be hanging out in the area or in the town during those hours. Um, and then in conjunction with the EPA, as was mentioned before, they are going behind the uh, zones being opened and, and allowing access for that 24 hour period or longer before they go in to start looking for those household hazards. So um, in speaking with them, there's gonna be a significant more amount of time than 24 hours before they're in there looking for those hazards. So I know there was some concern about that as well. That uh, segues nicely into the next question uh, that we have and then some subsequent questions after that. And so the next question is, what do I do if I don't have internet? How will I know if my zone is open? So I wanna tell you, uh, we are working really hard to get the word out to the public through as many platforms or uh, venues as possible. Uh, we are utilizing the traditional media by doing uh, media releases so we're asking that the traditional media, uh, print, television, radio, broadcast that out. So tuning into uh, your traditional media outlets will help you get notification. In addition to that, um, we have, uh, as I've said, and, and I understand if you don't have internet, you may not have access to this, but we put it out on our social media platforms, our Facebook page, our Twitter, another way that we ultimately get that out. And then lastly, what we have been doing is using the code red notification system, which you can go on to the Butte County Sheriff's website, log on to that. You can enter your cell phone number or your email address. And if you have access to that, we will notify you when uh, an evacuation order is lifted. Or like the case of Concow, um, we lifted the order but maintained the warning. And the warning is be ready to evacuate if necessary. And that was due to the potential for flash flooding like we had to deal with on Centerville. That is our way of telling people, be ready to go if you have to go. So those are the mechanisms that we're ultimately uh, utilizing. Uh, I would love to be able to give personal notice to everybody, but you know that just, we can't do that. So we're trying to do as much as we possibly can to get that word out. The next set of questions uh, deals with um, um, uh, along these lines, once Pence Road is open to Miguelia, what would keep someone from looting homes off of Pence Road? So uh, the chief and I can both speak to this because I got to tell you, this is a, uh, a big part of our operation and something that we're working very, very hard to deal with. We have hundreds of law enforcement officers who have come to Butte County to assist us, not only our local resources, but from out, outside the area. And as we open up these areas, we will continue those patrols utilizing not only Butte County Sheriff's staff, PD staff, but also uh, local law enforcement from throughout Butte County, including uh, state parks, uh, Chico Police Department, Orville Police Department, Gridley Police Department, as well as US Forest Service law enforcement officers. We will saturate those areas. As a matter of fact, as the chief said a moment ago, uh, if you get pulled over, I hope that you count that as a blessing, right? I hope that you understand, yeah that we're doing our job. And I was, up on, I was up in Paradise on Sunday helping with some of the escorts. I pulled a couple of people over myself um, who, didn't, who weren't displaying their placard correctly. Uh, and uh, actually they were thankful that I did it because uh, we're keeping track of it. So if you get pulled over, it's because we, we're doing our job and I hope that you'll understand that, okay? Thank you. <clears throat> Give me on that, okay. All right. The next one deals with a whole kind of series of questions along the line of when we uh, lift an evacuation order and how much time we give and um, how much time residents have and what the public has. And so I'm just gonna generally talk about it, try, try to answer all of those questions in one uh, felt swoop. So that said, as I've said, 
Uh, there's a lot of moving parts to this in terms of knowing when we can open up a particular area. And when we get word that we can open up an area based on uh, what our partners are telling us in terms of the safety issue, uh, our, we, we, we give, generally try to give three hours notice to the, to the residents of the area that we're going to open up. Now, I got to tell you that I uh, originally talked to our staff, we both did, about, well, why can't we give them 24 hours notice? And the debate that went back and forth between everybody is that so too many things can happen between that time period. It can cause more havoc by uh, uh, giving people uh, a time frame that, that doesn't have a level of certainty. And so we ultimately, uh, there was some discussion about giving an hour. We said, no, we need more than that. And we came up, we settled on three hours. Once we open up an area, it is open to residents of that area. And what we mean by residents are people who have proof to show that they live there in that particular area for a 24 hour period of time. Now, there's been a lot of confusion. Some people think that means you have to leave within 24 hours. That's not the case. That means we're just gonna hold the rest of the public at bay for 24 hours, hopefully to give you enough time to go up to your property, to look at it, to assess it, uh, if your property has been burned, give you an opportunity to go through, collect whatever valuables or keepsakes that might be there. Now, I realize not everybody can get there within the 24 hours, and I realize that the 24 hours probably isn't enough for everybody, but you have to understand we're balancing all of these competing interests. We are trying very hard to accommodate uh, the various requests that we get. I would love to, and I know the chief would too, give everybody the answer that they want. But the fact of the matter is, he and I have jobs that no matter what decision we make, somebody is going to be angry with us. And that's just the way it is, right? That's just the way it is. So we've set that uh, initial phase for residents to get in there. Now, some have asked, well, can I bring, uh, well, well, after that 24-hour period, then you allow the general public in. Well, why? Shouldn't it be open? Well, we can't keep it closed indefinitely. And as I talked to you about, our legal authority to keep an area closed, once it's been determined safe, uh, begins to dissipate or evaporate. And so the longer we go uh, to keep the general public out, the less legal authority we have. We feel that we're justified in keeping uh, the public out for 24 hours so the resident in. Beyond that, I don't know that we have, the, I don't believe that we have the legal authority to continue that practice. People have asked, can I bring friends and uh, 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 professionals like contractors and things like that to come in and help me? And the answer is yes. And that's another reason that we open it up beyond the residents after that 24 hour period so that all of those kinds of people can come in and help you out. There's a lot of reasons for that. I know it causes concern, but it's the best that we can come up with in terms of balancing all of those competing interests and trying to serve the various things that we need to serve. Okay. Do you have anything to add on that? Uh, I would just add, there's a significant amount of manpower that goes into holding that 24 hour period. Uh, a big thank you to our local CHP and across the, the North region. They are going to be holding many, many barricades and, and uh, manning those to make sure that people um, don't go beyond those zones to help keep the workers safe. And uh, it's just not feasible to, to maintain those after a certain period of time. So once those zones are open, um, they will be open and we're going to shift our resources. And uh, it may not seem like it because you're not seeing it three times a day or, or being in all the meetings, but um, all the resources are being effectively allocated to address all those remaining issues so that we can continue to open zones uh, as soon as they're safe. So I just want to reiterate that. And, and I'll add too, the, the, the National Guard has been here a lot and they've been helping us with that too. And it's been nice to have those guys here as well. So that's been a positive thing. Um, yeah, that, that's worthy of applause, absolutely. The other thing, neighbors, still have to help neighbors, right? And so when you get up there, if you see people messing with your neighbor's property that shouldn't be there, call us so that we can get up there and figure out who those people are. And if they shouldn't be there, then we can start dealing with it. We're all in this together, right? And so we got to do that from that standpoint. All right. Um, the next thing, the next group of questions deals with um, our law enforcement critical needs escort service, which we opened up this weekend. And we did that, and frankly, that's kind of unprecedented um, because this entire event is unprecedented. Uh, we've never had to keep these areas closed for as long as we've had to keep this one closed. And so we, we worked on a system that we could try to get people into the area ahead of the evacuation orders being lifted so that they could get 
uh, s critical items like vehicles that they needed to go to work with or um, if there was a safe up there that had imp important papers, we tried to get them up there. Or if there was an animal that we needed to help them get, we can do that. So that's how we ultimately came up with that, with that system. That system uh, can be accessed two ways. First, you can call 897-8873. And that call center is being staffed by uh, members of the Army National Guard. And we have uh, a group of law enforcement officers made up of my staff, the chief staff, U.S. Forest Service law enforcement officers, state park, peace officers, as well as Department of Insurance investigators who are helping escort insurance adjusters into those areas so that they can uh, begin to assess the property and help people with their claims. We have a limited number of resources. We're trying to work through as much as we can. Uh, as of tonight, we've received 1,675 requests. Um, we've completed 235 of them, but we're, <laughs> we're chunking away at them. We are trying. Um, and uh, like I said, you can call that number or you can go on to the Butte County Sheriff's website uh, at www.buttecounty.net forward slash Sheriff Corner. Scroll down, click on the link that says Law Enforcement Escort, and it'll take you to a, a page that allows you to make a request if you want to. I know it's not a perfect system. I know. And I know you'd, you would want us to be able to do it the same day that you make the request, but it's the best we can do right now. And, and what we've decided is that it's better to make progress than have perfection. And that's all what we're going to have to deal with going forward. OK? Good enough? Okay. All right. And I think I am, let's see. And then, Chief, I think you're probably, you want to talk about the time frames on the zones, and then I'll finish up with the ones that I think are not related to that. <laughs> You know, I'd, I'd love to stand up here and give everybody definitive timelines. Um, you know, the sheriff and I have said it multiple times. It's, it's such a dynamic situation, so many factors. When we go to our, our repopulation meetings that we have, you, ha you hear stories of AT&T and, and PG&E and Comcast. They're all trying to work in the same area. They're stepping on each other. And, um, and, and that just goes to show that they are committed to trying to get their jobs done as quickly and, and efficiently as possible. Um, they are making good progress. I know it doesn't mean much or it's not what you want to hear. Um, if we can open larger chunks, then that's going to be a lot easier on our side of the house to maintain and to, um, to regulate, especially for screening people at the checkpoints for that 24-hour period. So um, <laughs> we've been working every day since this happened. This isn't mm -hmm. something that uh, we want to drag on for, for a day longer than we have to, but there, there is order and um, there's a lot of things that we have to check the box on, so to speak. So um, it's not what you want to hear, but we are doing our best to, to get more zones open as quickly as possible. Yeah, and I, I echo that. That's, I think that's exactly right. That, we're doing it. So I have two questions remaining, and they're not related to uh, evacuation orders, things like that. Uh, so I think this will probably finish up what the chief and I have talked about. This one, will there be a better warning system if something big happens again? Uh, no warning, uh, fire almost burned. So let me tell you, um, I agree wholeheartedly with you that there was not enough time to warn everybody. The fact of the matter is, and it's interesting, and the chief and I have talked a lot about this, um, I had an opportunity to hear, um, I read an email from the first firefighters on scene in Polga. And they talked about how this fire was unprecedented in terms of how fast it moved. Uh, they did everything they could to hold it, uh, but it was moving so fast and, and just absolutely got away. And as what I've said, this thing was outrunning us before we even knew we were in a race. And then it was going in different directions and, and how it ultimately played out. By the end of the night, we were evacuating or doing orders to evacuate part of Oroville, Chico, uh, it was going in every direction that you possibly could. Now, there had been a lot of planning uh, ahead of time to deal with a fire that might come through Paradise. There was an effort uh, to pave the roadway uh, up Skyway over to Butte Meadows. Uh, there, was a zone, there were zones that were set up. Uh, there were uh, staged notification systems in place. And quite frankly, 
uh, despite the tragedy that we're feeling, uh, all of those efforts helped save thousands and thousands of lives. That's right. If that, if that work had not been done, I think this would have been a much, much bigger tragedy. I've heard people talk a lot about um, sirens and things like that. That's a discussion we've had here in Oroville, right, Mr. Conley? No. Yeah, w uh, when the Oroville Dam spillway incident occurred. Um, there are pros and cons to that. Um, if a siren goes off without any additional information, people don't necessarily know what to do. Uh, there is some, uh, uh, there's a discussion about the possibility of sending a broadcast out that warns everybody at the same time. We saw the problem with that in the Oroville Dam spillway situation. You immediately impact the roadways. Uh, so there's no easy answers. And I got to tell you, the chief and I were both up in paradise uh, when, it, when, when the smoke blocked out the sun and ash and embers were falling and there was fire raising up on all of us and we were trying to get as many people as we possibly can out. I tell you all of this because the fact of the matter is this thing is unprecedented. It moved faster than anything that we probably could. It outpaced the resources that we had. It overwhelmed our 911 system. Uh, it overwhelmed uh, your 911 system. Uh, but there are a lot of lessons to be learned. And as we go forward, we're going to work on trying to find uh, better ways and learn those lessons. And so the answer to the question, will there be a better warning system, here's my answer. I damn sure hope so. Okay? Good. And for those of you broadcast on TV, I'm sorry for cussing. But okay. The last question that I have is, um, have you confirmed what started the fire? And I want to tell you a little bit about how that, how that process works. So here in Butte County, as is the case in a lot of counties, uh, the investigation of the cause and origin of fires is handled by the fire service. In this case, the Cal Fire. The reason for that is they have their own law enforcement officers who specialize in the investigation of fire-related incidents, be it accidental, negligent, or, or arson, or something of that, uh, that nature. Before I came in here, I called the chief, uh, Chief Reed, and I asked him uh, what the status is. What he told me is that the investigation is well underway. It is continuing. It's a complex investigation. Uh, it's complex because of the way you have to investigate arson. You ultimately have to rule out all other causes before you uh, finally settle on one. And their uh, investigators have expertise on that. So the answer to the question is, uh, the investigation is still continuing, and I would look to the fire department ultimately to release those uh, findings once the investigation is done. That's all I have. Chief? And just to add on to that, I think that there needs to be a level of reasonableness in the community when it comes to assumptions, when it comes to that, to the degree that um, we are now paying for additional law enforcement resources to protect our utility workers, and we're taking our focus and efforts away from escorting you in to deal with your critical needs um, because there are some out there that uh, can't control themselves. Having said that, um, we will be out there. We'll have a strong presence, not only to protect your properties, but to protect our brothers and sisters that are our utility workers. So that's all I have. Thank you. So, I, hold on. I, uh, you know, I just will close with this. Um, you know, the chief has absolutely been personally affected by this. He lost his home, as well as a lot of other uh, members of his department. Um, my daughter works for him as a police officer. Um, they are, that department and the town, they are really going through a lot of it. But this is a tragedy that has affected basically all of our community because we've all been living it. And uh, I really want to say that uh, my interactions with many of the members of the community, I've been so amazed at uh, the character and the compassion that everybody has. I really thank you for that. I'm proud to be your sheriff. I know the chief is proud to be the chief. I, right, chief? Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. So thank you all very much. I appreciate it. And I'll take your question offline. Here. Good. I want to bring up uh, Mayor Jody Jones and Lauren Gill, uh, 
Paradise Town Manager to address some of the questions that we've given to them. But I also want to let you know we have lots of questions to answer and we will stay here and we will answer them. But we will also put information at ButteCountyRecovers.org. You can also email questions to ButteCountyRecovers at ButteCounty.net. I absolutely recognize that not everybody has access to the internet or a computer, and we're working on ways to get more printed information to the Disaster Recovery Center and out into your community. We will also be doing more community meetings and reaching out to your groups to talk specifically about the debris removal program. There's a whole lot of questions for Cal OES about that tonight, and I want to know I want you to know that we'll have more community meetings to specifically address that. The right of entry form is here tonight. If you'd like to pick it up, you can pick it up in the back of the room. Um, but I just want, I know some of you are starting to leave and we still have a whole slew of questions to get to. So I just want you to know there will be more opportunities to ask questions about the debris program and community meetings that are specific to that. And then we'll talk about animals after Mayor Jones and uh, Town Manager Lauren Gill. So I have a few questions about future planning and what the town is going to look like. I'm going to kind of answer them together. The first one is, will planning be done to redesign and or realign streets to promote safe escape routes east and west in addition to the existing north-south streets? Will streets be designed to be wide enough with adequate shoulders? So we are going to go through a design process for how our town is going to look in the future. We have an opportunity here to do some things that are different and better and safer. But we're not going to do that in a back room. There is no Wizard of Oz pulling strings saying exactly what's going to happen. It's going to be an open public process with design workshops that you all can participate in and let us know what you think the town should look like and what's important to you. That process will be coming. We're still kind of in the crisis mode, but in the coming months, we will get down um, down to brass tacks with planning, and it'll be a very open process over a number of months. Now is the time to innovate and be creative. We have a very dirty but cleanable slate, so to speak. What exactly are you doing to rethink paradise? So that's along the same lines. We're bringing in our business community to talk about what they want the business commercial district to look like. We're going to bring in our citizens and do that open public process. There is a rumor of a possible ordinance against manufactured homes being proposed in paradise. Is there any truth to that? Not at this time. But the council hasn't taken up any of these questions, and that question also will be a part of that design process and the actions that the council will take in open public meetings. I'm on the fence with regards to rebuilding. Please tell me how paradise will be better and safer. Tell me why I should want to rebuild my home there. I guess I could tell you what I think and why I'm going to rebuild my home there. I think that paradise will be newer. All the things that we're going to build are going to be built to newer building standards and more fire safe materials and, um, and standards. I also think that as a part of this design process, we have the opportunity to look at our streets and our evacuation routes and make those things safer. But to me, paradise is not about the buildings or the streets. It's about the people. And I want to rebuild in paradise because I want my community back I want the social fabric that we had as a community, and I think that's the most important reason to want to rebuild in paradise. But that's just me personally. So this one is kind of a personal question, but I'm going to answer it anyway, because some of you may be thinking it also. Are we to believe paradise officials who have lost homes have not visited their zones, such as the mayor? 
So no, I don't think you should believe that because many of you have seen me on TV. I have been up to paradise in an official capacity, always with either escorting people or being escorted, never by myself. I have escorted media and the incoming lieutenant governor who all asked to see my home. We have stood at the front of the property and looked at the pile of rubble. I have not gone through it. I have not stepped into where there is ash. My husband has not seen his home. My sister has not seen hers. But I couldn't do my official job if I hadn't been able to do that. So I've tried very hard not to do any of the things that you haven't been allowed to do. I haven't gone to look for my jewelry. And then my last question is, long range, what are we looking at to live back in paradise? And I, I think this person is asking for time frames. So I'll just give you very general time frames from all of the work that's been described, what I think are reasonable. So if your house is standing, you're probably looking at two to three months before you have utilities and it's clean around your property and um, you've had clean right, build right, go in there and get rid of the smoke so you could live back there. If your house is burned to the ground like mine is, you're looking at a much longer time frame. You heard today that debris removal is going to take about a year. And then you need to pull a building permit and design a house and get it built. So for me personally, I'm planning on two years before I can live in paradise. Some people who are maybe faster at it might do it in a year and a half. But I don't think anything faster than that is very reasonable. And that's all my questions. Thank you. We've been getting a lot of questions on the live stream about animals, and I am going to ask um, a representative from Animal Control with the county as well as NAVDAG to come up and speak. Good evening. My name is Lisa Almaguer, and I serve as the public information officer for Butte County Public Health and Butte County Animal Control. And I'm here with Norm Rosine. He is the public information officer with North Valley Animal Disaster Group, also known as NAVDAG. Uh, the, the two uh, uh, of us work in coordination as the authorized animal response teams for Butte County. Uh, we have two primary operations. Those are caring for animals in the shelters, which right now we have 1,300 animals. Um, our shelters are, are being run very smoothly right now. We have an abundance of volunteers, and we have capacity in these shelters. Um, when this disaster started, we had over 2,200 animals. We are now at approximately 1,300. So we have room. Uh, we continue to take in animals when they're brought to us um, and continue to bring rescued animals um, when they need to be rescued to the shelters. Um, the second operation is uh, caring for animals within the fire. Um, uh, affected evacuation areas. And we have shelter in place operations going for over 600 um, locations up in the fire affected area. And um, we continue to leave food and water out for animals that we see, even if they haven't been reported into us. Um, so I'm going to go over, uh, we've got 20 teams on the ground, by the way, every day. And they do visit these shelter in place operations um, every two to four days, depending on the need and location of these animals. Um, so I'm not, I haven't had a chance to see the questions that are coming in on the live feed, so I will not be able to address those, but I will address, uh, Norm and I will address what we have here on the cards, um, and then if we need to, we can take some offline conversations tonight and you can speak one-on-one -on -one with us. 
So here we go. Um, resources say you are not taking any more rescued pets. Why? If our shelters are full and the animals are sick from upper respiratory infections, why not use other shelters? We are taking um, pets. And as I mentioned, we are down in our numbers and we have room. Uh, we have capacity to take pets. So I'm, I'm not sure, you know, this misinformation gets out there all the time. But if you have questions, you can call us. And you can also call the hotline for NAVDAG, which is 895-0000. Um, in regards to sickness, um, a lot of these upper respiratory infections are uh, infections that the animals came in with, with their acute exposure to the fire and the smoke. Um, they had smoke inhalation. Um, but you know, illnesses happen in shelters. In human shelters, in animal shelters, you have confined space um, and Ill illnesses do happen. And so when we have sick animals, we isolate them in separate areas from the well animals and we work with veterinarians to come in and care for them. Second question is, how long are you going to continue to rescue pets? Um, and it goes on to list how long the Tubbs fire, Katrina, uh, other Sonoma fires. The answer is, we will rescue pets as long as they're in need, period. Uh, third question is, how do you intend to handle small domestic pet recovery efforts going forward? Um, we're going to continue doing exactly what we're doing. We're going to continue sheltering in place with our 20 teams that are on the ground every day. Uh, we're going to rescue injured animals when we come across them in the field. And I'll, I'll let Norm talk about what he's seeing in the field. He's been up there for nine days straight. Um, and when those evacuation orders are lifted and you're able to get into your property, um, you'll have access to your pet as well. Um, so time frames, we're doing it right now and we're going to continue to do it. Um, there's a comment about um, about thousands of pets missing, and I'm, I'm going to let Norm address that because that's not what we're seeing. Yeah. So hi, I'm Norm Ozine from North Valley Animal Disaster Group. I'm part of the evacuation effort up there and the rescue effort. Uh, I've been up there a lot all over the areas that were affected by the fire. We don't see a lot of animals uh, having problems up there. We're sheltering in place every single animal that we know about or that we see. So if you request for service for us to go up there and leave food and water, even if the house is destroyed, we're going to do it. If along the way we see a cat that's uh, in an area that we haven't known one to be reported, we're going to add food and water to that area and continue to shelter it in place. This is the standard of, of the industry for disasters, is to shelter animals in place if they're A, safe, and B, they're in an area that is safe. So. If we look at an animal and we see it's injured or having a problem, we're going to recover that animal and bring it to our shelter. But a lot of these animals are um, outside cats and they're, you either trap it, which is very difficult and hard for the animal, or you're gonna feed and shelter it in place. And again, that's not us that come up with that standard. That's the welfare, animal welfare organizations around the country that is the standard in the industry. So what I've been seeing is that the cats are all doing fine that I've seen. Sure, there's some injured ones and we grab them when we can. There aren't very many dogs left up there. Um, there's one that I know of, we shelter it in place. I saw it yesterday, it's fine. And, and it was asked the question, do we shelter in place in areas where there are burned houses? And the answer is yes. We know there are cats that we're not seeing. We're addressing those needs. And, and we, we look daily at the weather and say, is that still a good thing? Is that a decision we want to make? And if we need to change that decision, we will. But I can tell you that I've been to the shelters today, all of the shelters. The cats and dogs are doing well. Everything is going according to a plan. And we have a system in place. And should you have any questions, please call us at the hotline so that we can answer your question or we can address an animal that you're concerned about. So I have an additional question, and I'm, I'm going to try to, to, to uh, figure out what, what's being asked. Um, so it says, is it legal to stop letting evacuees with pets without notice? Discrimination on disability and pets. I, I believe this question might be in relation to the, sh the sh co-shelter, where we have people at a uh, shelter where we also have animals co-sheltering at that shelter. Um, and I, I'm thinking this might be about maybe a service animal. So animals and pets are 
in separate areas at the co-shelter, but folks who have a um, legal uh, service animal are allowed to have that animal with them where the rest of the people are. So I hope that I, I um, answered this question the way it was, in, it was being asked. Um, so I have probably eight or nine questions, which I'm just going to take a wild guess is from the same person because the penmanship is the same. And I'm, I'm sorry? OK, wonderful. Thank you for your questions. I think we addressed many of the items. Uh, when will you, why are you stopping to rescue? Uh, why aren't you feeding animals in the locations that have been requested? And we are doing all of those things. But what we would invite uh, you to do with us is to have a conversation, to be cognizant of everyone's time. We would love to talk with you. OK, so we're not going to do the back and forth conversation here, um, but I would be, but we would love to talk with you. I think you can see that the room is starting to dwindle and we recognize that it's beginning to get late and we have gotten a lot of questions so we want to continue to get to them. I'm going to be strategic about who we call up here based on how many of the questions were answered during the presentation portion. So I'm going to ask uh, Kevin Hannes from FEMA to come up and address some of his questions. I'll make this quick. Uh, they're fairly standard. The first one I want to address is something that uh, with all social media and rumors, there's always a little bit of fact in there someplace. And so the question was, did FEMA or some government authority displace fire refugees from a casino property in order to house pre-existing homeless people in the middle of the night? No, we did not do that. Now. We were working with Rolling Hills uh, campsite uh, trying to acquire some leases. What we found out today is that they were asking people to leave so that we could lease their pads. I said, no, we're not going to do that, and we are no longer working with Rolling Hills at this time. I don't play, OK? Uh, does FEMA kick in if insurance does not cover all of your personal belongings or things that were underinsured? There were several insurance questions here. If you are underinsured and you're registered with us, if you are insured, let me start off, if you told us when you registered you were insured, you got this nasty letter that said you were found ineligible uh, for FEMA assistance. That's because we cannot duplicate benefits. Insurance is a benefit. Once you get your insurance documentation and you've reached a tentative settlement or we understand what your policy will cover and will not cover, bring that to us at the Disaster Recovery Center, call us on the 1-800 number, upload your documents to the disasterassistance.gov, and if there is an underinsurance or a part of your policy that was not attributed to the fire and you had a loss, then FEMA kicks in and starts to work with you. So that's the insurance. Um, and that really talked to this one. Why are people who are responsible and have insurance, paid taxes, being denied FEMA and government help other than cleanup? You're not being denied. We are making sure that we maximize your eligibility, uh, that we do not duplicate benefits. As I said before, these are your tax dollars coming back to work for you. We want to make sure that we are good stewards of them. But more importantly, uh, this is a case for insurance. It, I'm not sure how it's going to work out here in the campfire, but for Hurricane Harvey, it was flood. Those with flood insurance received about an $80,000 payout. Those without flood insurance received about 4500 Big difference. And so that's what insurance is there for. It's the first line of defense, and we encourage you to, to maximize your insurance. But if it's not enough, then you can work with us to do that. Finally, where are the FEMA trailers? When are they going to be here? I think I, I talked to you all about that. As soon as we know where those sites will be, who is eligible for those, uh, you will be notified uh, by that. A couple of criteria. You have to have been a homeowner or a renter with a physical address. You have to have over $17,000 worth of FEMA verified loss if you're a homeowner and a renter. And if you are a renter, your home has to been that you're residing in has to be destroyed. Either we're destroyed or your home is probably habitable um, in this event. And so many people will be 
potentially eligible for it. I will tell you, not everybody will take advantage of it. Other people will find resources on their own, and that's what we really encourage, is to find those resources on your own. But if you need us, we're there. We're going to help you through this, this process. There are people with, with FEMA shirts in the back. They can update your case. Uh, feel free to talk to any one of us. We'll be more than happy to stay here as late as you need us to to help you through this recovery. Thank you. We've gotten some questions specific to a speaker that we didn't have providing a presentation tonight, and I would like to invite Curtis Johnson, who is the Butte County building official, up to address some questions that are specifically related to standing structures. Thank you. The first question I have is regarding living in RVs on your affected properties. The county currently has limitations on living in RVs or travel trailers. However, due to the housing crisis that we're currently in, there is an urgency ordinance that is going to be considered by our Board of Supervisors this coming Tuesday the 11th. So more information will come after that. Another question uh, was along the same lines, but uh, more specific as to if there are any limitations to where you could possibly place your RV on your property um, in relation to berm structures. Uh, we do not have that information at this time. The debris removal process is still being uh, finalized, so there will be more information soon on that as well. The next question is in regards to if your home is standing and unaffected by the fires, even if you have a detached structure on the property uh, that is damaged, can you return to your home? As far as um, the building department is concerned, if your home is safe to return to, we are not standing in the way. If there uh, are other hazards on the property, I think a lot of people have spoke to the, the different various hazards. Um, just be cognizant of those. Uh, when returning to your home, definitely be aware of the hazards around not only the home but the trees. Um, take a look around before you re-enter. There may be placards on the home. There may not be. Many homes do not have any identification from us. Uh, if there is a green placard, it means it was inspected and there were no structural hazards found. If there is a yellow placard, it means that there may be limitations, there may be some damages. Uh, be sure to take a look at the placard. There will be listed any hazards that you should be aware of. Um, red tags on structures, you will not see too many of those. Obviously, homes that were um, uh, uh, received obvious damage uh, do not need a tag. Uh, if you have any questions whatsoever, you can contact our department. Uh, we're located at 7 County Center Drive. Um, call, email, um, come down and talk to us at any point. Once again, this is uh, only for county structures. Anything within the town of Paradise, you would um, seek the answers from them. The next question is, when can we start obtaining permits for cleanup and rebuilding? Um, the cleanup process uh, has been gone over tonight, so I won't touch on that. Um, there's not a permit for the cleanup. That's a separate process. Uh, for rebuilding, you have to have your property cleaned prior to uh, receiving a permit to rebuild. However, the county will be accepting applications and plans to review prior to that cleanup being completed. So you can start the process be ready to go once you receive the green light. Uh, as far as clearance, we'll be ready to issue you a permit. Uh, last question was actually outside of my wheelhouse, uh, but we did track down the answer from somebody else, and I'll share that with you. The question is, can we cut down trees on our property when we return? So the county does not have any restrictions on removing hazardous trees on your own property. Thank you. We received a number of questions for PG&E, Paradise Irrigation District, and the Insurance Commissioner's Office. So 
What we, what we know is they largely address the questions in their presentation, and I am going to ask these representatives to step to the back of the room, and if you have a specific question for them, you can join them back there and ask it so we can move on to the last couple of um, folks. What I will say is that it's very important when you re-enter your area that if there are downed power lines, you should assume that they are energized and you should call 911. So PG&E wants to reiterate that you should always be very cautious of downed power lines. I'm going to ask Eric Lamoureux from Cal OES to join us up here to answer questions about the debris removal program. He received the most questions tonight, and so I know there is a lot of interest in this program. Please remember that we will hold specific community meetings in all of the communities and multiple of them to address this program. Thanks, Casey. Um, as Casey said, obviously a lot of questions, uh, 26 to be exact. I'm not going to read all 26. Um, I need all of your help. Um, there's a lot of your neighbors that are out there locally. Uh, they've, they've, they've moved on from the area, helping us to spread the word. We're going to use all the different channels we can, but we really need all of your help in spreading the word and, and answering some of these questions. You know, I'll start by saying that we started doing these types of debris removal programs over 11 years ago in South Lake Tahoe, and we have conducted these operations across California to great success. Last year, for the first time in our history, we had to ask the federal government to help us with the cleanups that were going on in the North Bay. A lot of you have some questions related to that, and we'll talk more about that as we continue to talk about debris. What I want to tell everybody is we cleaned in about six months nearly 6,000 properties in the North Bay. A very small percentage of those had some challenges that we had to work through, but it was a very small percentage. What we're fortunate to have this year is the state will be running this debris program. We'll be hiring the contractors, we'll be overseeing those contractors, and because of that, we'll have a little bit more control over the activities of those contractors on your property. So first uh, question, will we be able to go into our property before the final cleanup is done? Um, yes, you will be able to go in as soon as the local law enforcement tells you it's safe to re-enter, you'll be able to go in and start looking for mementos. What we ask is that you not disturb the debris. Don't dig into the debris. Don't try to move the debris. Um, it's, it's hazardous debris. Even after our EPA and toxics crews go through, the ash that's remaining is still toxic. And so you have to exercise extreme precautions. So it's one thing to find a memento that's on top of the ash or easily recognizable and pick it up and wash it off. But I would ask you, don't dig into the debris. It's just not safe for you. A number of questions about who's going to clear our lots. Uh, and as I said before, we are uh, going to be getting state contractors. Cal Recycle, the state's recycling and landfill agency, will be overseeing this operation in coordination with Cal OES. They will be hiring the prime contractor who will do the work and there will be opportunities for local contractors to be subs to that operation. We cannot put any guarantees in place or requirements in place to hire locally. But as the director said earlier, we have upwards of 14,000 home sites alone to clean up, not to mention the commercial sites that we'll be cleaning up as well. There's going to be plenty of work to go around. And so there's going to be a tremendous number of opportunities for, uh, for local contractors to get involved. Uh, a few questions here um, about the contracting. I, I spoke about that. Once the prime contractors are on board, Cal Recycle will have a link on their website, on their contracts page of their website, as to how you can get engaged if you're a local contractor or know a local contractor that wants to get involved in the project. Uh, there's a misconception about the program that it's free. We are not going to charge you, but we do have to ensure that we're not duplicating the state, federal, and local benefits that have been authorized to cover the program. So many of you have insurance. In that insurance, you may have a clause in your insurance specific for debris. We'll be looking to collect that amount. If our project costs $60,000 and you have $20,000 in your insurance policy for debris, we'll look to collect that $20,000. 
We are not looking to make ourselves whole. The state, the federal government, and the local governments have authorized to pay for this program, but we have to ensure that we're not duplicating taxpayer benefits. If your insurance, if your debris is covered as part of an umbrella policy, we want you to rebuild first. Once you've rebuilt, if there are proceeds left that we can collect for debris, we will. If there is not, then we're not going to be looking to make ourselves whole. Okay? So it's not a free program. We're going to be looking to collect from your insurance. But we will not be looking to make ourselves 100% whole for the cost of the removal. Um, several questions about trees. We will be focused in our operation removing the ash and debris from where your home or your outbuildings burned. We will not be clearing the vegetative debris around your property. We will not be clearing patios. We will not be clearing sidewalks, driveways. We'll simply be focused on that contaminated ash where the home burned and came down. We call it the ash footprint, and all of our work is going to happen within that ash footprint. Whether it's your home, whether it's an outbuilding, whether you've got a side garage, those are the areas that our operation will be focused on. We will go in and we will re remove all the foundations. If your home wasn't on a foundation, we'll be removing the stem walls. If there's a particular wall that's also retaining earth, we'll likely leave that and you're going to need to design around it. What we have discovered over time is that the structural integrity of your foundations and your stem walls has been degraded to the point it's not safe for you to rebuild. So we remove those through our program. If you want to keep your foundation, the county will have an opportunity for you to do what we call opt out and hire your own contractor. But through that, you will have to bring an engineer in to certify that your foundation is safe. Okay? In addition to removing the foundations, we're going to be removing the contaminated soil. Generally, that means we're going to remove three to six inches of soil. We're going to test the soil and make sure that we have removed all the contaminants. If our results come back and show we have not removed all the contaminants, we will do an additional scrape, again, of that ash footprint. If those tests come back and they're, and they're positive, we're done. There are some instances, rare instances, where we may end up removing up to 12 inches of soil. That's the exception. It's usually about three to six inches of soil. I will tell you, at the end of the operation, your site will not be build ready. We're removing contaminated soil. You'll have to return that soil. What we will not be doing is creating swimming pool size holes in your yard. We will simply be removing the contaminated soil that needs to be removed and nothing more. Question about whether we should bring tarps to cover salvaged items. What you want to do on your property is up to you. Um, if you want to cover it with tarps, that's fine. What we have been doing in partnership with the county and the city is we've been working to install mitigation efforts throughout Paradise and the unincorporated area to try to keep debris from washing off of your site into watersheds and, and into roadways. So there are some measures that have already been put in place to address some of that. But if you want to cover your property, you can certainly do that. Uh, this question, how do I know when it's safe to return to my burned out residence and property? Who removes the hazardous waste? So as the sheriff indicated earlier, they will indicate when it's safe to re-enter that area. Through our phase one program, they'll be removing household hazardous waste, but that by no means means that your home site is safe. So as long as debris is there, if you authorize us to come clean it, and we haven't cleaned it, you need to know that there's still significant contaminants there. When we start our project, there will be an office in Chico that will be our debris office. That office will be open to you every day of the week for you to come in and ask questions 
when's my lot going to be cleared, if you have questions about what you agreed to. If you fill out your right of entry form and you believe you left something off that's important for us to know, maybe you forgot to mark where your septic tank is, maybe you didn't mark where your leach fields are, maybe you've got a pool that's got plumbing coming out of it and you didn't mark that on your ROE, you can come back to us and you can clarify that. Those are all going to be very important things to include on your right of entry form so that we can take steps to ensure that we don't damage that property um, when we're on your property. Uh, we will not be removing septic tanks. Uh, we will not be doing any remediation to septic tanks. What we do want to know is where that septic tank is so that we can make every effort to avoid damaging it or further damaging it. Sometimes, especially the plastic septic tanks have already been damaged by the fire. If it's a concrete tank, we don't want to unnecessarily crush it with our equipment. A uh, couple questions about mobile homes. On mobile homes, we will require a right of entry from you, the individual that owns the mobile home, and also a right of entry form from the individual that owns the park. So that's the only nuanced uh, uh, situation with mobile homes, is a right of entry form will be required from both individuals. Um, somebody had a question about some items on their property they didn't want removed. Um, if that item is still there, uh, this was a, a, an out structure for their, for their cats, make a note of that on your ROE. And we will make every effort to ensure that that remains there. Um, we are, again, focused on just where the home burned and not collecting patio furniture or other knickknacks or things you may have in your yard, but simply removing that contaminated debris. A uh, question about uh, if a contractor get in, gets injured, are they going to sue me? We put provisions in our contract that all the contractors have to cover workers' comp and cover the injuries to, to those workers. I can't stand here and tell you that some contractor uh, may, may decide that they want to sue. I will tell you that they're gonna, they don't have much of a leg to stand on. Uh, they, went, they go into this assuming the risk of working in a hazardous area like this, and we put provisions in the contract to ensure that they cover all of the costs of injuries to their workers. I'm sorry? The question was, what if they damage the septic tank? Again, we are asking that you identify that for us so that we can mark that area off and avoid that area. We can, we can, we'll have to handle those on, on case by case issues, um, but the important thing is to, to mark those. Are residents who survived, um, residents whose homes survived at risk of living there as the debris removal occurs? So our debris removal effort will include air monitoring in the community. It will include measures to keep dust and particulates down using water. When we collect the debris, we do what's called a burrito wrap in our, in our dump trucks. So all the material is contained inside a plastic liner to prevent ash and debris from blowing near the home site or as it's being transported through the community. The county's requirements will be similar if somebody chooses to do their pro cleanup themselves. And so we take extraordinary measures to ensure that those individuals who are living in the area aren't exposed to dust and particulates. Um, but obviously, you're, if your home survived, there's going to be measures that you'll need to take to, to clean your home. And there's contractors that you can hire to do that. But outside your home and around your home, we'll be taking measures to ensure that we're testing the air and we're keeping the particulates down. Uh, this was a question about uh, trees, leaves, um, other uh, material that burned, we won't be removing any of that. There's no real contaminant to green waste that burned on your property. It doesn't look good, but we're not going to be clearing that. If you want to clear that yourself, if there are trees you want to take down, vegetative debris you want to remove, you can do that. You can use the proceeds from your insurance that are set aside for debris. We would ask that you keep the receipts so that when eventually uh, we come to collect your debris portion, if you've already used a portion of that for other debris removal, we just need you to be able to document that to us. 
A uh, question about uh, for individuals who maybe want to put a trailer on their property, how far does that trailer have to be removed from the debris pile? This is something that's probably going to be more of a possibility in Concow and some of the other unincorporated areas where we've got larger lots. The county will ultimately determine what the setback will be required. Um, but it's probably going to be at least several hundred feet, room enough for us to be able to get in there with heavy equipment and clean your property without having to require you to relocate. But the county will have more information on that. A couple questions about foundations. I think I addressed that earlier with our program. We do remove foundations, so if that's something that's critically important to you um, and, and you believe that your foundation is still uh, structurally sound, then you have the opportunity to opt out, handle the cleanup yourself, uh, as long as a structural engineer has signed off that your foundation is safe. I think that's it. Um, I'm going to stay in the back of the room tonight. If anybody's got any other questions I didn't address, I'll be happy to address those. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much. Several of our speakers are still in the back of the room. Um, and again, we encourage you to follow um, your social media sites as well as regular um, media outlets as we announce additional community meetings related specifically to the debris program. Thank you again for being here and have a safe night. <laughs>